Uh, I think uh, more than tiga belas ribu berapa? Thirty uh, thousand and more. Thirty-three zero. What? I uh, pardon me. Thirty thousand three zero. Uh, three three zero. Th okay. Thirty and three zero more and um, more. More and more. Yeah. So you're still in um, quarantine, lockdown. Uh, in here we we don't uh, quarantine, but uh, we we stay at home. Or oh. uh, in here uh, like PSBB, yeah, uh, like that quarantine, but mm -hmm. not uh, we not uh, apa lockdown no. A lockdown no. Okay. Here we are in quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> Still work from home. <laughs> yeah. Sure. The students are also online as well yeah, as Yeah, yeah, still online. Um, I don't know until when. Yeah. It's it's a bit different when you talk online yeah. and when you talk in, in the yeah. classroom. <laughs> so different. <laughs> yeah, it's very different. Look at now. This is the yes. something something new for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Is this a, this is my first time actually to do a webinar. Oh. Yeah. This is but your it, first time, yeah. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Good Joanna. morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, how are you? I'm good. We okay. are working from home now. Yeah. We yeah, are under people. quarantine. <laughs> yeah. Me too. We have a, like a home isolation. So yeah. we need to stay at home. Yeah. yeah. We are all at home. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. We can wait. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. My meeting is still at uh, around 1 p.m. Jakarta time. No, no, uh, later, later. One oh, yeah, later. Yeah, mm. yeah, could be. Yeah, we, we still have to discuss what are we going to do for the next academic year mm -mm. since we could not. Um, expose our students to the hospital. Mm, yeah. So what yeah. could we do? Yeah, it's different. In Indonesia, we have a, we have a, like a new regulation that uh, we also invite a student uh, for the to help uh, nurses. Mm. But uh, we, uh, the government will provide uh, everything, PPE, for PPE. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think our government could not afford. <laughs> I think students should buy their own PPE. <laughs> oh, it's difficult because they, yeah. they already pay more. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know for, for CNU, yeah. there is free tuition for our students because we are a government ah, university. Okay. Oh yeah. So it will be a bit, uh, it will cost lesser. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> good news, but uh, we don't know what will be the extent. Uh, our hospital is yet um. The experience in the hospital is pending yet. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we could do a simulation at school. Oh okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Can I start now, Mrs? Yeah, can be. Okay. We will yeah. start, Miss Joanna. Sure, sure. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning ladies good morning. and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to the public lecture by Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta today. May 80, 2020. I will be the moderator today. My name is Ayu Cucu Iskandar. I am a nursing master student at the Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta. I am glad to meet you all through Zoom apps. I know we have a hard time and a hard situation from the pandemic of the coronavirus globally. I hope this situation cannot stop us to increase our knowledge related to health science. So, now, we have a public lecture about GERD in the perspective of the nursing care. First of all, thank you to 
Head of Master of Nursing Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta, Mrs. Viti Arofiati, PhD, to give us opportunity to learn together in this public lecture. Uh, Mrs. Viti, may I ask you to say hello to our participants today? Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Assalamualaikum Hello. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hi. Uh, I can see there are uh, so many participants also from not from Indonesia. I think. Waalaikumsalam. <laughs> yeah, I think these are Please my colleagues here in the Philippines. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much for your coming. Uh, I'm familiar also with uh, Mom Joni. Yeah. <laughs> Mom Joni, right? Mom Joni, show your face. <laughs> Mom Joni, it's long time no see you. Ah, there, Mom Joni. Yeah. Yeah. Mom Joni, how are you? Oh my God. Okay, we can see here. We can meet here. Thank you so much for all of our participants uh, who will learn and share uh, about good. Actually, uh, this is part of uh, the learning process in Master of Nursing in uh, my university, Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta. So uh, usually we invite a speaker from other country. So in this time, uh, we since we have a collaboration with Cebu Normal University, so we invite one of a uh, uh, faculty to give a lecture uh, so that uh, we can uh, learn each other about God. So uh, thank you so much again and enjoy uh, by zooming, right? <laughs> we we <laughs> to zoom <laughs> to connect each other. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Fitri. And then may I briefly introduce to you our speaker from Philippines, Miss Joanna Marisi Calstilo. RNMN. She is an instructor on in the College of Nursing from Cebu Yorna, uh, sorry, Cebu Normal University. Normal. Hello, Miss Joanna. Uh, may I ask you to say hello to our participants today? Hello, everyone. My name is Joanna Casquillo, and I'm an instructor in the College of Nursing from Cebu Normal University. I see friends from the Philippines also. Hi everyone and the master students of Dr. Titi in Indonesia. Uh, what's the Indonesian for good morning? Is it Salamat Pagi? Salamat Pagi, yeah. Uh, Salamat Pagi. Okay. Pagi, um, Mr. Joanna. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, uh, before we start, I'd like to tell you uh, some rules uh, during uh, our online public lecture. Okay, the first is please mute your microphone when this event starts. And the second is participants can ask questions in the chat column. I will read your question in the discussion session or you can ask directly to the speaker with my agreement. And then the last is not allowed to write things are, that are not related to the theme of the public lecture in the chat column. But if uh, there are uh, any trouble, you can chat in the column. Okay. Uh, please complete the attendance list by click a uh, link on your screen. You can take a picture or right now. Okay. And then we will provide a link to download the A certificate for participants who have completed the attendance list, but in the end of this event, all right? And now, I think, okay, uh, Miss Joanna, uh, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be sharing my screen. Ooh. see it now yes 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 okay all right so this lecture a short lecture is entitled gastroesophageal reflux disease in nursing perspective so this will be just a short one around 20 to 30 minutes and this will include an overview of the disease itself a short recap of the anatomy and physiology the pathophysiology 
the clinical manifestations, risk factors, and also diagnostics and current treatment options for GERD. This is very important to individuals with the understanding of what is really the disease about, and of course, to improve our nursing management. So have you asked yourself, why do we need to study about, or why do we need to review what is gastroesophageal reflux disease in this time of COVID? <laughs> so I think I will be giving you a short um, perspective. What is happening now in GERD at a global perspective? So are, there are many studies, especially population-based service studies that indicate a rising prevalence in GERD. Specifically in our Western culture, there is a prevalence of 20% in adults, and this increases with age, particularly after the age of 40 years old. But it is also in the study that it said that there is no difference between male and female when it comes to prevalence. However, they said that the males have a greater chance of uh, getting complications out of this one. On the other hand, here in Asia, there is slightly less prevalence that's from 5 to 19%. That's lesser in Eastern Asia compared to Western Asia. But what's alarming for GERD is that GERD was considered to be a disease of the older population, but now there is an increase in the proportion of younger patients, meaning even at the age of 30 years old, you can now get GERD. So given this picture, I think there is a need to revisit what is GERD and what are the possible um, challenges and ways we could, we could do in order to manage it. Before I start with the meat of my lecture, I want to have this activity. It's just a very simple mental activity. I will be posting questions. These questions are answerable with a yes or a no. So I would ask the participants to uh, mentally remember how many yes, yeses to these questions you have. So I'll start with posting my questions. There are 10 questions. So do you smoke? Do you drink alcoholic beverages? Do you like eating chocolates? I do. <laughs> do you like drinking coffee? Do you prefer spicy or sour foods? Are you always anxious or are you stressed? Do you sleep right after eating? Are you overweight or obese or are you pregnant? So these are your questions. Remember your answer and then let's see how is it related to our topic later. So what is GERD? GERD is also means gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's a condition wherein your stomach contents, the food, the gastric acid, flows back into your esophagus, causing that irritation of the gastroesophageal linings and of course, that burning pain. Normally, when we eat food, um, food enters our mouth. So we chew our food, it becomes your bolus. And then when we swallow, through that hollow tube named your esophagus. And then the peristaltic movement of your esophagus propels down your food to your stomach. But in between your esophagus and your stomach, there is what we call a muscular lining. It's a gate that opens and allow food to enter, but it also closes so that food remains in the stomach. What happens in GERD is that this gate, this muscular ring, also known as your lower esophageal sphincter or your less, relaxes abnormally or weakens. So this allows your stomach contents to go back or flow back to your esophagus. And the clinical manifestation, and the cardinal symptom is number one is your burning sensation, or normally we call it your heartburn. So this is usually felt after eating and can worsen at night. Some patients may have chest pain, difficulty swallowing, or what we call dysphagia. We have painful swallowing or your odinophagia. We also have regurgitation of food or sour liquid. That's why some of the patients feel that sour or bitter taste in their mouth. And of course, there's also sensation of a lump in your throat. 
sometimes there are also extra esophageal symptoms, meaning these are symptoms usually experienced outside the esophagus, especially if your gastric contents reach the respiratory tract. If it reaches your larynx, there could be hoarseness of your voice, there could be cough, or there could be respiratory illness such as your asthma are at risk for the, um, developing this disorder or this disease. So remember the mental checklist that we had earlier, the activity we had earlier, those are questions of risk factors. So I hope you did not get perfect yes for all those questions or else you will be more at risk for getting GERD. So there are conditions and behaviors that will increase your likelihood of developing these disease. Let's start with conditions. Example is your obesity. When you're obese or you're overweight, this gives increased pressure to your lower esophageal sphincter. It weakens it. When you have hiatal hernia, it's when the part or the upper portion of your stomach protrudes to your diaphragm that also gives um, pressure to your LES or it weakens the function of your LES. Another risk factor is pregnancy. So there are two things that you have to remember if you're pregnant. There is an elevated progesterone. This progesterone also weakens your LES. And of course, if you are already in your late trimester, you're in your second or late trimester, um, the pressure of the growing fetus to your stomach may push the contents towards your esophagus. Connective tissue disorders also may be a risk factor incurred is specifically your scleroderma, and of course, um, conditions that cause delayed stomach emptying. We know that your stomach empties around two to three hours after eating. So if there are conditions that delay the emptying, then there's a bigger chance for the stomach contents to go back to your esophagus. So, so much for conditions as risk factors, there are also risky behaviors. Let's start with smoking. Um, we know that smoking or cigarettes contain nicotine. This nicotine is also bad for your lower esophageal sphincter. It weakens it. And also, um, people who want or like to eat large meals or wants to eat late at night. So these are also risk factors for GERD. Patients who also, or people who also like to eat fatty and fried foods is also bad. And... Coffee lovers out there, caffeine containing, tea lovers, alcohol, it's also a risk factor for And also patients who are taking NSAIDs, your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, your aspirin also, some of the antidepressants and some of the calcium channel blockers are also risk factors for getting this hurt. So how does your diagnose this type of disease. So basically your doctor gives or checks or do a physical examination as well as asking for a history of your signs and symptoms. For example, the doctor may ask when was the onset of that heartburn? Um, did, did you have the heartburn after eating or it was it worsened when you lie down? So these are samples of questions that your doctors can ask. But if they want to confirm um, the diagnosis of this disease or check if there are possible complications, they may ask one or more of the following procedures. They could ask for an upper endoscopy wherein if a flexible scope is inserted inside your GI tract, this scope has a, um, a microphone or a light at the end of it so they could visualize your esophagus down to your stomach and down to the first part of your small intestine called the duodenum, And there is also what we call barium swallow, wherein you are asked to drink a chalky substance. It's whitish substance. And then they'll take, they take an x-ray of you. And another procedure is what we call the acid probe test. Um, they insert a monitor inside your lower esophagus, and then it will, it will try to check when is that, or when is the time that you're stomach contents go through the lower esophagus and until or they it also measures how long does it last there and last but not the least is your manometry or this is a procedure wherein they measure the 
the strength of the contraction of your esophagus while swallowing. So this is how your doctor tried to diagnose you if you have GERD or not. So for um, this picture, this is an example of images taken if you have endoscopy. For this is your esophagus. Can you see uh, the, the center part? That's your lower esophageal sphincter. The middle picture is your duodenum. This is part of your small intestine. And the third picture is your stomach. Can you see the rugae? So this is a picture of your stomach. So how do you treat, how do doctors treat persons with, with GERD? So the basic treatment option for GERD, especially for mild cases, is they start with lifestyle modifications and over-the-counter medications. When I say lifestyle modifications, example, if you are obese or overweight, they may want you to lose weight. If you are an alcoholic, then they would want you to stop drinking alcohol. If you are a smoker, then you have to stop smoking. These are some of the lifestyle modifications that you have to do. And of course, they will be ask they will be asking you to take over the counter medications. Examples of which is antacids. There are also over the counter medications that are classified as PPIs or proton pump inhibitors. So these are for symptomatic relief of GERD. But if you don't respond to either of this lifestyle modification or over the counter medications, then your doctor may have a strength medication. More or less, this is given for moderate cases. So examples of drugs that will be given are two receptor blockers, those medications that ends with the tidin, we have ranitidin, pomotidin, those are H2 receptor antagonists or blockers. We also have proton pump inhibitors. These are the medications that end with prazole. We have omeprazole, pantoprazole, esomeprazole, lansoprazole. So these are your PPI. Also medications that strengthen your lower esophageal sphincter, example of which is your baclofen. And for supportive treatment, sometimes the doctor includes prokinetics. These are medications that promote the movement of your GI tract, especially for those conditions who have um, who cause delay in stomach emptying. So among all of these medications, the most effective according to studies, the effectivity is from 50% to 80% is your proton pump inhibitors. So most GERD conditions are given PPI therapy. But again, if you don't respond to prescription strength medications, for severe cases, your doctor may have give you surgery as an option. So we have Lynx device, the insertion of a Lynx device. This is a small device. These are magnetic beads. The strength or the magnetic strength between these beads will help the lower esophageal sphincter in its function. But it is not strong enough because it still allows your food to travel from your esophagus down to your stomach. Another surgical intervention is what we call funduplication. This is more common because it's less, um, it's, what to say, it's cheaper than your Lynx device. So this funduplication, the fundus or the upper portion of your stomach is wrapped around the backside of your esophagus and then it is stitched. This uh, type of surgery also helps in supporting your lower esophageal sphincter function. So all of this that we have uh, mentioned from anatomy and physiology down to your treatment is very important for nurses to learn so that we will have an idea how we could manage GERD or how we could manage patients with GERD. And what is um, very important for us to remember is that GERD, though it is a very simple disorder, it is a disease that affects not only the physiologic well-being or the physical well-being of a person, but it also affects the mental, emotional, and social aspect of a person. We have to know what are the common client responses of 
GERD, or what are the common client responses to GERD? So we have physiologic responses. More common or the most common response is pain. Your patient feels pain. There is stomach pain, there is heartburn. Another physiologic response is changes in eating habits. So because there are already foods that are, are not allowed for this type of patients, then they will have changes in the eating habits. And because of that, it can also lead to weight loss, um, losing weight beyond the normal, or um, and also nutritional deficiencies that comes with it. Other common client responses, not just physiologic responses, but also emotional and psychological responses are fear and anxiety. Fear because it's maybe their first time of, uh, first time for the disease itself is, is something new to them. Or anxiety because they have things left undone, maybe at work or maybe in family or maybe stress because of the hospital, hospitalization and the cost of hospital, hospitalization, the economic burden. So these are sources of stress, emotional and psychological stresses. And of course, food aversion. One time um, during my, uh, my hospital duty, I think I, it was three years, four or three years ago, uh, one of my clients told me that she was really affected emotionally because when she was diagnosed with GERD, eating now becomes a very stressful situation for her because when she eats, she feels pain. So he does not like, she does not like eating anymore. She, she told me that eating should be a pleasurable situation. It should not be a stressful, stressful situation. So that's one of the things that we have to consider when we manage client with GERD. So, what are we going to do? So as nursing, we have to do prevention and health promotion, of course, restoration of health. When we talk about GERD, GERD is, um, it's always lifestyle modification as a cornerstone for the treatment of your GERD. So as nurses, we are called to do health education. So we have to teach them what are the things that they have to avoid in order to have the recurrence of the symptoms and what are the things that they have to do in order to prevent the recurrence of these symptoms so i have made a mnemonic just to remember some of the things that we have to teach our patients so i've named it be safe and for bmi within normal so if you are above normal then meaning you are overweight or obese so you have to lose weight E stands for engaged in relaxation techniques or activities. One of the risk factors really for GERD is stress and emotional upsets. So you have to relax in order not to have GERD. S stands for stop smoking and drinking alcoholic beverages. A, dietary triggers. I'm talking about the foods that I mentioned earlier. Your highly seasoned foods, spicy foods, fatty foods, um, sour foods, those containing caffeine, those are dietary triggers. If, if your patient does not tolerate large meals, then we could um, advise to have frequent but small portion of food intake. For example, you can have small food intake during your breakfast, then you can have small snacks, then small lunch, then another snacks, then small dinner. But we have to remember that the last meal should be at least three to four hours before your bedtime. And if you want to sleep, you have to elevate the head of bed or you could use your pillows to, to elevate your head. This will support or this will allow gravity to keep your food inside the stomach. Further, as clinicians, we are also there for the patient to restore their health. One of the things that we usually do is help in the administration of these prescription medications. So as nurses, as clinicians, we have to know what are these medications. I have already mentioned some of the medications that they, we have to read what are these medications, how to give them, 
what are the side effects so that we could anticipate the patient needs if there are um, side effects. Sometimes also we are required to do physical and emotional preparation, especially if your patients will undergo invasive procedures and or surgery. For physical preparation, I am referring to fasting, um, pre-medications to be given and special instructions depending on the procedure. And for the emotional preparations, sometimes our patient verbalizes anxiety because it's their first time to undergo such procedure. So you, it is very important that you as a nurse, you are there, your presence is there, and you're willing to listen to whatever issues or whatever concerns that they have for that particular procedure. That is very important in taking good care of the emotional well-being of our patients. And in, spe in special cases, some patients may need emotional and psychological support. So here, as one of our role as nurses is being a counselor. But if you don't feel that you are trained enough to do counseling, then we can always refer them to um, health care providers who could do so. Or, example, if your patient has a hard time um, stopping from smoking or stopping from alcohol intake, we could always refer them to community resources. There are self-help groups or help groups out there, your anonymous groups that that is focused on smoking cessation, for example, and um, doing something about alcoholism. So are now the challenges and our ways forward for GERD. When we talk about challenges, GERD is a chronic condition. There are times that they have to be re-hospitalized. There are relapses of cases. There are many, many way of many things or many situations that leads them back from, from their home back to the hospital again. So what is the most important thing that we could do for this patient? It's constant communication because we have to gain the trust of the patient. We have to know what is the reason for this hospital re-hospitalization. Why, why are they experiencing, again, the symptoms? Maybe they are, they are not telling you that they have a hard time adhering to that strict lifestyle mod modification. Maybe they cheated. They, eat some, they, they ate something that is against the... Uh, the food that they should not eat. Maybe they drink coffee, maybe they ate a little chocolate, and that's why there was a relapse of all those symptoms. We have to know all of this as healthcare providers because it will matter in their care. Another challenge is that this is very common. We have to differentiate what is the difference between the chest pain that is caused by your heartburn and the chest pain that is related to cardiac disorder. So as nurses, we have to, to have these good assessment skills to be able to differentiate the two. And last, but definitely not the least, is that we have to create a patient-centered approach to GERD. Um, I've come to this uh, challenge of making a patient-centered approach because I have realized that each of the patient has different response to a particular therapy. For example, patient A may respond to a PPI therapy, while patient B does not well respond to a PPI therapy. So we have to check what is the uniqueness of each of these patients and get those factors and fit, it, fit those factors inside your care plan. So this is an example of your patient-centered approach. And we have also to include them in decision making. So we have to include them in the therapy. So what do they want? What are the things that is favorable to them? So those are um, types of approaches that we could use for this patient. And before I end this lecture, I would also want to leave you with one challenge. If in the future you'll be given another opportunity to take care of a client with GERD, you to be more open-minded because GERD is not just about heartburn. There is anxiety in GERD. There are stresses in GERD. 
challenge you also to be more holistic in the approach, knowing that GERD does not just affect the physical aspect of a person, but also the mental, emotional, and social being. And last but not least, I challenge you more to have a deeper desire to change or give your patient quality of life. And with that, that is your challenge. I'll end the lecture. Thank you very much for listening. Ma Kasi. Okay. Wow. Oh, you give us an hour some explanation about girl today, Miss Joanna. Thank you. Are you <laughs> All right. Uh, All there. Right. Are, okay. Uh, ada yang mau bertanya? Are you want to ask to speakers? You can write in the chat column or you can ask directly. Okay. You can raise your hand. Okay. So, who want to ask? All right. If you not yet, Miss Joanna, uh, we have uh, one question. Uh, you know, we still uh, in Ramadan month. Uh, we we still fasting or saw. Oh and yeah, then, I agree. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, how to? Uh, apa ya mm, give uh, give advice for our patient that he or she still uh, fasting or we can cannot uh, drink or eat around uh, uh, eight or nine hours. What advice we can give as uh, nurses? Mm. Okay, I understand that our Muslim brothers and sisters have to go fasting, the seasonal fasting for Ramadan, right? And for me, um, fasting is quite a challenging task, uh, shall I call it task or shall I call it an experience? Because we have a different tolerance to fasting, correct? Yeah, some could, could, could tolerate the fasting for, for a short time. Some could tolerate fasting for a longer time. So if it's if I don't know really if if in your religion in Islam, if what can what can we do if you really could not tolerate the nine or eight hours fasting? We could usually they they what they do is that we could really advise them to to have food intake before the start of the fasting. Usually you have your food intake right early in the morning. Yeah. And then another in late in the evening, correct? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. So if if a patient that is a Muslim who is undergoing fasting but has GERD, let's just say the patient has GERD, um, it is very important that when she or he eats in the evening, Usually very late. Around what time is that? Uh, Usually in, what time is that? Uh, in here at uh, 6, 6 and 30 minutes. Oh, uh, okay, 6.30. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you could you could just, um, what do you, what you call? You could arrange your schedule of food intake in the evening. Very important that it should be at least two or three hours before you lie down or before you sleep. So you also you also adjust your sleeping time to allow your stomach to empty before sleeping. All right. So eat early before the start of your um, fasting, and then your last meal in the evening should be at least three to four hours before lying down. That would be a great help for patients with GERD doing fasting. All right. Yeah, we call uh, in here we call it sahur. Sahur. Uh, yeah, sahur. Uh, we can eat uh, in the morning before fasting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, uh, we already have uh, one question from Swanti. Miss or Mrs. Swanti, you can uh, on your video or your, I can see your face. <laughs> uh, you, uh, 
are you want to ask directly to Miss Joanna or I just read your question? It's our Mrs. Swanti. Hello. All right. All right. Uh, there are a question, Miss Joanna. Uh, she asked, is there a special approach to geriatric patients with GERD? Uh, you mean geriatric considerations with GERD? Yes. Um, there are some approaches for geriatric patients because most or commonly GERD is a disease of the older patient. So very important, especially for geriatric patients, is the, the one I've mentioned earlier, the differentiation of the heartburn the chest pain that they are they are experiencing so we have to be vigilant or we have to do a better assessment when it comes to chest pain experienced by geriatric patients because we have to differentiate it if it's really a chest pain caused by heartburn or chest pain that is related to cardiac problems especially really for female geriatric patients because we have what we call this a typical symptom of um, cardiac problems that involve the symptom chest pain. So one of the things that we have to remember for geriatric patients is that one, the proper assessment and proper identification if this pain is plain heartburn or this pain is plain cardiac problem. And of course, with, with the food intake, I think um, we have also, I think there are no such significant difference with how geriatric patients eat. Maybe um, there is a um, lesser portion. We could, we could advise geriatric patients to eat lesser but frequent meals. Um, examples of which as I have already as what I have already discussed earlier we can have or we could advise them to eat at frequent episodes but smaller portions they can well tolerate it and then for um, uh, activities and exercise we could have them um, engage in in rest uh, we could uh, we could advise them that activities should not be done after eating because this would increase the risks for having GERD. We could advise them for rest after eating, and then same for um, before sleeping. They should have their meals three to four hours before. That's it. All right. Okay. And then we have uh, another question, Miss Joanna, mm, from Lawrence Garcia. Hello, good morning. Hi, Lau. <laughs> okay. Uh, and other participant, uh, can you mute your microphone, please? Okay, Miss Joanna, he asks, are there Philippine characteristics that predispose them to GERD? Are there? I'm sorry, come again, are you? Yeah, I'm sorry, it's uh, uh, in a, uh, he asks that, are there Philippine characteristics that predispose them to GERD? Philippine characteristics. Ah, yeah. Philippine, Filipinos. Filipino, Filipino characteristic. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, according to studies, there is um, more of the risk factors that is um, associated with GERD is the possible increase in the prevalence or the increasing aging population the obesity and of course the changes in sleeping patterns but when we talk about filipino characteristics um the culture of the philippines we have a lesser prevalence or a lesser chance of getting the, the getting GERD. 
But if a Filipino has risky behaviors, for example, um, we we sometimes most of the Filipinos love to to drink coffee. Most of us love to eat spicy foods or sour foods. This could be a predisposing factor to developing GERD. But for Filipino characteristics, I think there are there are no um, associate and no strong associations or significant studies that have linked Filipino characteristics to having GERD. Even in Asia, as I have mentioned earlier, we have a lesser prevalence of GERD as compared to the Western culture. Maybe because we have a lesser um, um, patterns of behavior that least predispose us to this particular disease or to GERD. All right. Okay, thank you. And then we move to another question. Uh, there are from Mr. Agus Suparno, student in here. Uh, he asked, is there a specialist gastroenterologist for nurse? And how is it developed in the Philippines? Mm. Actually, here in the Philippines, we don't have the formal education to become a gastroenterology nurse, though there is a doctor that specializes in gastroenterology. But, but when we start working, especially uh, for, for my, for my, from my experience, when we start working, we could be assigned to special areas that, um, that will hone us more. So, for example, in a hospital, there would be special units. For example, your ICU unit, your delivery unit, your operation, uh, operating room unit. There is also a gastroenterology uh, unit or your GI unit or your endoscopy unit where you could be assigned or, and where you could learn more about gastroenterology. But here in the Philippines, sadly, we don't have yet, yet, any formal education that is very specific to gastroenterology. Though we have, for now, we have um, education in the master's level. For example, me, I have my master's in medical surgical nursing, specifically the adult health nursing. So we have a touch of gastroenterology, but not just gastroenterology. We could go beyond what is um, in medical surgical nursing. Yeah, that's what is happening here in the Philippines. How about in, can I ask, how about in, in Indonesia? Do you have um, gastroenterology nursing? Yeah, same in here. We not have yet. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Agus, how you can uh, give some speech? <laughs> okay, all right. All right, uh, there are another question. Uh, to Mr. Uh, from Mr. Ahmad Burhan, uh, you can ask directly to our speaker, Mr. Ahmad Burhan. I cannot see your face. You can on your video. All right. Uh, I will read her uh, his question uh, to Miss Joanna. Uh, I have I have a chronic GERD patient, and I have the first complication of typhoid fever, and become a liver abscess and sepsis. How is the next management from the nurse's perspective? Ah, okay. Um, chronic GERD. Usually, this is not a common, the, the complication, I'm reading from the chat, uh, chat room. The complication is typhoid fever, and then it became liver abscess and sepsis. Um, as what I can see is that this is not a common complication of GERD. This is usually have other, uh, this, of other causes 
So I'm not a medical practitioner. This is just my my hum, uh, humble uh, opinion about the case. I think there there is there is really a need for for the doctor to check on the other causes of this um, existing condition, your typhoid fever and your liver abscess and your sepsis, because there is a different um, etiology for both. And what is the next management from the nurse's perspective? For me, it would be depending on what is the pres the, the client's response to your typhoid fever and the liver abs uh, and the liver abscess. May I know what is the current condition of the client or the patient? Okay. Uh, depend depend from uh, response from patient. All right. Yeah, yeah. The the management now at the, at the nurse's perspective will now depend on what is the present client response to the problem because it's not now about GERD. It's about liver abscess and sepsis already. Yeah. Yeah. So if the patient is really septic, then we have to manage the infection first before we can go back to the the management for GERD. So we have to do something about the liver abscess. The doctor could do operation on this and we have to manage the sepsis first. If the patient is febrile, then we could do something about the fever. Or um, um, it, it really depends on what is the client's response to this particular situation now. Because this is yeah. really not a typical complication when it comes to GERD. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Pak Burhan, bagaimana? Apakah ada respon? Mrs. Burhan, you uh, are you want to give respon for uh, for the answer from the speaker? <laughs> All right. We move with Joanna to another question. Uh, there is from Safina. Okay, Kak Fina, uh, I give you a, uh, I give you permission to ask directly. Miss Fina, please. Okay, there are no response, so I will read her question. Okay. I have question, please. Okay, uh, you can ask question directly, uh, Doctor. Okay, um, I'm from um, Indonesia, but now study in Taiwan. Uh, may I ask with the presenter? Uh, in your yeah. country, uh, for for make diagnosis of uh, GARD, um, their doctor should be has do endoscopic for for do for make sure their ha their patient has GERD or not. Uh, for my experiences in the Central Java Hospital, for make sure there has uh, GERD, we should be have doing endoscopic. How about your country? Please explain, please. Thank you. Oh, okay, based on based on my experience here in the philippines when a patient presents with GERD, especially if it's just a mild case usually the, our doctor does not um does not do endoscopy yet so it will really depend on the presenting signs and symptoms especially if the doctor is um entertaining if there is already esophagitis or if there is erosion in your esophagus the doctor could do endoscopy or if your um, signs and symptoms is recurrent recurring meaning it um, they experience the symptoms one or twice in a week and it's uh, recurring in many months sometimes the doctor will now start with endoscopy it is not always that when they diagnose with GERD they then do endoscopy Usually, the doctors here in the Philippines are very conservative in that because our healthcare is quite expensive. 
So they can start with the minimal um, minimal treatment options. As what I have mentioned earlier, they can start with diet modification, then giving of your over-the-counter medications. And if this, um, if your client respond to lifestyle medication and OTC, then there's no need to do endoscopy anymore. But if the clients go back again, or they go back to you, or they go back to the hospital with the same symptoms, with the same complaints, and this time it's more severe than the usual, so the doctor can or may may suggest doing endoscopy to be able to see what is the specific type of GERD that the patient has. Because there is um, what we call phenotypes when we talk about GERD. We have the non-erosive and then we have the erosive esophagitis. So it depends really. I hope I, I answered your question, Dr. Madden. Okay, one more question. Um, if we like a nurse, uh, what what the minimum sign and symptom we should be have in the in the for the patient we can diagnose uh, they are they are there has GRD. Oh, okay, uh, uh, as nurses, it is not our responsibility to diagnose GERD, but there are for gastroenterologists they have these standards or guidelines that if this if these are met or one of these are met then they could diagnose it with GERD. It really depends on what guidelines they are following. But as mm -hmm. nurses, though though we they though we can entertain that the patient might have GERD, it is not our responsibility to diagnose that, oh patient, you have GERD. It's not like that. We could just um, we could give them or we could advise them to see a doctor, for example, if they are experiencing heartburn once or twice in a week and if it's recurring. So that's how nurses should be. We should not be, be the one diagnosing that oh you you patient you have GERD. So you, we can always we can always um, no I mean I mean like see. this no. I know oh. we, we like a nurse we cannot do a diagnosis we that's not yes. responsibility of, uh, do that but True. we should be has uh, knowledge how to know they are have good for do collaborate with the doctor right hey, correct and you, correct. Uh, may, may you explain in your country what does uh, sign and symptom minimum we we should be know with their patient and we we need to do uh, collaborate with the with the doctor, for example. Uh, for uh, okay, for example, here in the Philippines, based on experience, they the doctor always asks us to watch out for recurring heartburns. If your patient is is experiencing heartburns or experiencing chest pain, usually after eating, or um, heartburns or chest pain that that becomes severe after lying down. Or heartburns or chest pain that is very that they feel especially at night then mm -hmm. if we we see these signs and symptoms usually we refer them to our doctor so they could check check on the patient mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah and and also if this is uh, if they have really history of 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 having this type of gastro uh, gastric related symptoms we uh, it's not just the one time it's not just that this is the first time experiencing but if this is a recurrent um happening then we could inform our doctors that oh doctor do you have your patient like this and this is not just the first time that they are experiencing this they have pr uh, prior experiences of such signs and symptoms okay thank you uh, for welcome. your answer all right. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, can we move, Ms. Jonah, to another question? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Fina, I have a question. Uh, there are, um, you explain from your presentation about GERD and anxiety disorder, how to reduce anxiety in GERD patients, especially in COVID-19 situation right now, uh, because uh, anxiety can apa ya, uh, include uh, COVID-19 and 
how we reduce to in patient with girl oh how to reduce anxiety in girl patients especially in covid-19 situation right now this is, this is quite a challenging task for us nurses yeah because usually our patients do not go to the hospital unless it's already very severe meaning if you have, if you have very if you are having a very severe heartburn or a very severe stomach pain so how can we reduce anxiety so mm It would be good for me as a nurse. It would be good that these uh, these patients would engage in in relaxation activities. I I mean that there are things that we love to do, right? There are there we have our hobbies. For me, I like to read. Or if you want to watch um, movies, if you relax by watching movies, or if you if you do painting, then we could advise them to do painting. art therapy anything that will re- that will release the the stressful um, emotion we could advise them to do such activities or um, even as simple as allowing them to to what we call this allowing them to express their anxiety amidst covid-19 if they have somebody at home or a friend that they could call that it would be a good way of of releasing the emotion someone to talk to and doing the stuff you uh you ordinary uh i mean doing the the things that you really love these are things that we could do to reduce the anxiety amidst the covid-19 situation now and i hope there is nobody having gerd because of covid-19 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we just uh must uh, relax. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You do uh, you do things that relax you relaxes you the most. Okay. Yeah, watching All movies right. for example or talking with friends or scanning Facebook. But we can meet, we cannot meet uh Uh, apa ya our friends or we can not go out <laughs> i know from... but you can you you can do zoom with friends yeah <laughs> right okay. <laughs> yeah right okay for all of our participants are you have another question again you can uh, raise your hand or my my, my i just uh, add uh, one information Yes, okay. uh, to add more uh, information about the question from Pa Agus, yeah, it's about the uh, what about the nurse uh, special in uh, gastro. Sure. Yeah, in Indonesia actually uh, we have a, a specialistic program after master uh, degree, and we can take a specialistic uh, in. Uh, some areas like for example cardiovascular and including gastro so if uh, nurses who really want to continue their study and take a specialistic in uh, gastro they can but until now maybe uh, mostly they choose like uh, cardiovascular and then respiratory something like that and uh, In Indonesia also, we have a career path. Yeah. Career, yeah. We have a career path uh, in nursing. So uh, actually, uh, this is also part of uh, our uh, concern in uh, nursing career path. So we can uh, sharpening our knowledge and skills, uh, focus on what uh, we really want to, to deeply understand about. Like for example, I maybe uh, for for now I focus on uh, uh, cardiovascular something like that. So uh, and it's not only for formal education. We have also a training program uh, on how to really uh, give uh, opportunity to nurses to understand more about uh, some 
uh, case. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Fitri, for your explanation. All right. And also, can I add yeah, something yeah. with regards to specialization in nurses? Also, here in the Philippines, we, the our board of nursing is also working on on the specialization part of of uh, of the nurses, giving also opportunities to to go through to go to the specializations or the field that they would want to to prosper in. So I think that would be a good step, both for Indonesia and for the Philippines. I hope it will push through. Yeah. All right. Uh, there are uh, uh, our participant. Uh, are you have another question or we can finish uh, our webinar in here? <laughs> if you have another question, I uh, give you opportunity now. Can you can raise your hand or you can ask directly? No, not yet. <laughs> All right. If there are no question again, uh, I think we arrive to end of this event, Miss Joanna. Thank you. <laughs> I Thank give, you. Uh, yeah, I give uh, some conclusion uh, about uh, our event, and they are uh, gastroesophagus uh, reflux reflux disease. Uh, there are um, many uh, cause the problem like uh, lifestyle and then uh, a patient uh, no no just not just sickle a sickle but they have a psychologist effect and emotional effect and then uh, Miss Joanna have have us uh, tips that simple and then uh, they are B E S A F E, right? Uh, and then nurses must have communication skills and good assessment skills. And we we give a patient centered approach to GERD like that. All right. And then I will share link. I will share a link uh, to you and you can download a e certificate from here. Can you see? Yeah. Yes, I yes. can see. Yeah. You must uh, fill, fill out a link for attendance list before and then you can download your e certificate to link. Uh, below. All right, you can take a picture or you can write. Okay, are Wait. you done? Wait. All right. So, may you give me the, the picture again, please? Oh, okay, okay. Wait. Hmm. Okay, can you see? Not yet, okay. Okay, you can take a picture or write it. Okay, done? Okay, I, I will stop. And if you uh, have a question again for uh, the link, you can contact uh, contact person in our poster. Okay. Okay, ladies and then ladies and gentlemen, that's all public lecture today. Thanks for Miss Joanna as our speaker and thank you all thank you all of our participants today. I hope we all keep strong and healthy. See you at our other lecture at or our other webinar wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh
Thank you, Miss Joanna. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fitri. Thank you for our participants. See you. Especially for Dr. Daisy who open the opportunity so that we can contact with Joanna because it's just a very short time. Very short time. It's less than thirty minutes, right? We we have discussed about this and just okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Mr. Long Rains, Garcia, thank you so much. And everyone, thank you. Thank you so much. Keep safe. Maybe next time, Sebu can also invite us from Universitas Muhammadiyah Jogja so that we can have a balanced activity. Yes, hopefully. Yeah, thank you. We'll continue to have a connect each other. Bye. Bye, Mam Jo. Bye, Pitre. Bye everyone.